clap your hands, all ye nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy, for the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. Hello and welcome to QP Online. My name is Kaz and I'm one of the pastors here at Queen's Park Baptist Church and it's really great to have you joining with us today. Later on um, in our time together, Ian, our senior pastor, is going to be sharing to us from our series Amazing Grace, looking at the letter that was written to the Galatian church by Paul and just sharing with us um, something from part of chapter four this today. But as we look around us, the world just seems to be in a real chaotic mess, doesn't it? It can leave us feeling so anxious. It can leave us feeling worried. And so as we prepare ourselves to hear from God today, let's lift our eyes up to him. Let's look to him, our fortress and our protector. We're going to do that. We're going to begin doing that today by reading some verses from Psalm 46. The words are going to come up on the screen so that you can read them with me. Um, and there's just something really powerful and um yeah, something really special when we speak out words straight from scripture together um, as God's people. But I also want you to note that Psalm 46 is a noisy psalm. It talks about banging and clattering. It talks about the earth shaking. Um, and so as we read it, you know, maybe you don't want to just read the words, but maybe you want to make lots of noise in the background as you do it as well. Maybe you've got a drum in the house and you want to pause this right now and go and find the drum so that you can bang it as we read these words together. Maybe you've got some shakers about that you could use to make some noise with as well. But as you make noise, it's a reminder that our God is bigger than the noise and the clamour of this world, that he is greater than all of that. It's a reminder of what it says in this psalm as well. So once you've got your noise-making instruments, um, then come back and join us and let's read these words together from Psalm 46. God is our protection and our strength. He always helps in times of trouble. So we will not be afraid even if the earth shakes or the mountains fall into the sea. Even if the oceans roar and foam or the mountains shake at the raging sea. There is a river that brings joy to the city of God, the holy place where God most high lives. God is in that city. And so it will not be shaken. God will help her at dawn. Nations tremble and kingdoms shake. God shouts and the earth crumbles. The Lord all-powerful is with us. The God of Jacob is our defender. Amen. We recognise that with everything that's going on in the world right now, particularly with the situation in Ukraine, that we can just feel completely overwhelmed. 
Maybe you've noticed in the last week or so that your fight or flight reflex has jumped in much more often than you've experienced before. Maybe it's neither flight nor fight, but instead for you, it's been more like being frozen, just completely overwhelmed, unsure of how to respond, unsure of how to help. Well, we here at Queen's Park Baptist Church are part of a wider family of Baptist churches, not just here in Scotland, but across the world and particularly across Europe. And so the Baptist Union of Scotland has put together a resource page on their website pointing you um, to resources from both the Baptist Missionary Society, BMS, and also from the European Baptist Federation. Um, both of these organisations have put together prayer resources um, and other bits of information, um, but both have also got um, monetary appeals as well. So if you feel called to give in this time to what is going on, then these are great organisations to connect with. We do um, really encourage you to do that if that's how you feel led at this time. Um, also, just these guys are out on the ground. Um, I've seen pictures from some people that I know around the European Baptist Federation actually out working on the ground on the border between Poland and Ukraine, just meeting people as they cross the border, taking care of them, handing out um, food and sleeping bags and, and clothing and whatever is needed to people there. We also know that there's about 2,400 Baptist churches in Ukraine, another 1,600 Baptist churches in Russia. And there are people throughout these churches who are just desperately trying to help everybody that they can. And so by connecting through BMS and uh, the European Baptist Federation as well, we get to connect with these churches as well and support them um, in lots of different ways. And we've just popped up the address um, on the screen for you um, with the website address for um, the Baptist Union of Scotland and their resource page for finding out more information about all of this. But the big thing for us as the church is that we're called to pray. We're called to bring all situations before God, but particularly these situations. Um, this is something unique that we bring to the world. As God's people, we can pray, we pray to him. Um, and there is power in our prayers God hears our prayers amidst all the chaos. Um, and so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to pray together. And the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to begin by using the rest of the verses from Psalm 46 to read them out together. So just as we started off with that declaration, turning our eyes towards God, we're going to continue to read the Psalm as a prayer. Um, and then there's a pr short prayer that's going to come up on the screen after that. And I'd love us just to speak all these words out together. Maybe you're sitting in a room by yourself right now. But know that you're speaking these words out with brothers and sisters in Christ all over the place. Because we're reading them out together. And God hears these voices together. So let's read these words, first from Psalm 46, and then the prayer, as I say, all of it will come up on the screen. Come and see what the Lord has done. The amazing things he has done on the earth. He stops wars everywhere on the earth. He breaks all bows and spears and burns up the chariots with fire. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be praised in all the nations. I will be praised throughout the earth. The Lord all-powerful is with us. The God of Jacob is our defender. Father God, King of all nations, we ask you to stop the war in Ukraine. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, we ask for your peace to come in Ukraine. Holy Spirit, Comforter and Counselor, we ask you to be with all those who are scared and anxious in Ukraine and beyond. Amen. Amen. 
it was really great to get to celebrate our Global Focus weekend last weekend and so fantastic to have Paul Davy with us just sharing what God's placed on his heart for us and the challenge that he brought to us as well. And that reminder that we are called to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. There is a call to walk in the tension of both together um, as the people of God. As I mentioned earlier, Ian, our senior pastor, is going to be taking us back into the series Amazing Grace um, today, looking at the letter to the Galatian church. But before he does, let's read some words from the passage in Galatians. So we're going to read uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that there is in your word. We thank you that your word is living and active, that it has something to say to us specifically today. And God, we pray for Ian. We thank you for him. We thank you for his preparation for today, for all that you're doing in him and through him. God, would you give to him as he pours out this morning? And Lord, for each one of us, would you prepare our ears to hear from you? Open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. God, let us not come to your word and leave it the same as we approached it. But would you change us? Would you challenge us? And God, would we respond to that today? Amen. Well, welcome again to QP Online. It's good to have you with us today. We're looking at the book of Galatians, this uh, remarkable uh, story, letter, in which Paul stands for the gospel against many stresses and pressures that are coming in upon the little churches in Galatia. We're in chapter 4 today, and uh, just a couple of verses that we're really going to uh, narrow right down on. So if you just turn with me and read these uh, words, then I'm sure you'll find that helpful as we, as we look at them together. Galatians 4, uh, verses 8 and 9. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Well, uh, a number of weeks back, we celebrated together in our Camp Hill building as three people were baptised. The first baptism really since we were locked down and the pandemic hit. Now there's nothing like a baptismal service to remind us about the life transforming power or the good news of Jesus. Each person who was baptised was declaring in their baptism and as they told their stories that they had encountered the living Lord Jesus. I've come to know God personally, is what they were saying. All three were Iranian, and it's always exciting to me to hear how their story breaks through the translation. I love that. And uh, if you've had that experience too, I'm sure you share in that joy. It's really lovely when you don't know the person being baptised, you don't and even know their culture or their language, but your heart leaps with joy as you hear their story and as that story resonates with your own story in coming to know the Lord Jesus. The good news of Jesus' death and resurrection is the power of God 
for salvation for anyone who believes. I have met the Lord. I'm a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. That's what we proclaim. That's our story and it's what we celebrate. And there's no message on heaven or on earth which quite works or changes people just in this way. It is unique. It is special. There is nothing like the message of Jesus. This is the massive claim that we make as Christians. We have come to know God. That's extraordinary. Ordinary people, insignificant in the scheme of life, we have come to know God. Back in um, 1517, a man called Martin Luther nailed some statements, thesis, to the door of the church in Wittenberg in Germany. And as he did so, he was confronting the medieval church with a real simple statement. And he basically said, on this I stand. It's by faith alone that we come to know God. Nothing extra, no add-ons, no small print, no um, clauses to catch us in a trap. And this is Paul's Wittenberg door moment as well. It's his line in the sand where he sends this remarkable letter to the churches in Galatia, where he simply says, trust in the cross, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't add anything else. No decoration, no small print, no further instructions. And that's what our friends are telling us today. They're telling us of the wonderful power of this simple message that believing in Jesus Christ brings us to know God. So here's the first point for us just to note. We have come to know God. That's what Paul was saying. What a privilege just even to be able to say that. And it's all too easy to overlook, to overlook the scope of what is being said. People being baptised, believers in Jesus, Paul himself are claiming a personal relationship with the God who formed the universe. That's a quite astonishing claim. I don't know if you're the kind of person who stops for a pint of milk or for the Sunday paper on uh, your way to church. Uh, I wonder what would happen if somebody said to you as you're exchanging uh, your money for your newspaper or your milk, I wonder what would happen if somebody said, are you going anywhere interesting today? And your answer would be, well, I'm going to meet with some friends because we are meeting with the author of creation today. That's what we were doing. That's what we do when we gather. That's what we do when we pray. It's all too easy to overlook the scope of what it means to know God. It's also easy to overlook the sheer privilege of knowing God. Since humans first looked out on a dark and starry sky, we have wondered what lies beyond. Man's quest for God has occupied the greatest thinkers and spilt however many gallons of, uh, of ink over the years. And of course, many of us, if not all of us, have contemplated the question, does God exist? Can we know him? And here we are today saying, in Christ, we have come to know him. We have come into relationship, not through finding immortality through what we do, not because we have sought to appease some kind of distant God, but because we have met the living God. All these other ways, all these other patterns are patterns that bring us into slavery to weak and worthless things that Paul says in, in verse 9. All these uh, rituals, all these um, habits that have sought to create relationship with God have failed and yet we have come to know him through Jesus Christ. Remember the sheer scope of what God has done. Think about the incredible privilege of knowing him and remember too the sheer intimacy of knowing him. We might be capable of understanding a God who would deal with us at a distance uh, in the kind of way that um, I might say, well, I know the Queen. You know, I've, I've seen her. Um, I've been fairly close physically. I've 
read and seen things in the, in the news about her. But that's very different from Prince Charles. Prince Charles, if you asked him if he knows the Queen, he would say, Mummy, of course I know my mummy. And this is the language of relationship. It's the language of knowledge, that intimate knowledge that Paul is talking of here. He's saying, I know God relationally, not just information about God, but I know God. If you're a French speaker, it's the difference between connectre, the knowing of relationship, and savoir, the knowing of information. We know God relationally, intimately, personally. Isn't that amazing? Jesus himself says in John 17 verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We were made to know him. I hope that you do know him. If you don't, then simply asking that he would come and enter your life, forgive your sins, and make that relationship real um, will be a, a prayer that you can pray. And in that and through that, come to know him. Maybe you already know him. And I, and I hope just being reminded of the, the privilege and the, and the scope and the intimacy of this relationship will stir your appetite and you'll want to know him more. Paul is saying to the Galatians, you have come to know God. This is the most amazing, incredible privilege. But we can't just make ourselves know God. We can't just scramble up to this kind of place of, of enlightenment. We only know God because God first knew us. And so Paul says, secondly, rather you are known by God. We know him, but actually we are known by him. God acted first to make it possible for us to know him. The wonderful message that Paul is reminding us of in this letter to Galatia is that God has intervened in our world in the person of his son. He's broken the prison walls that enslaved us, broken the shackles and the locks that, that held us in darkness and desperation. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Colossians 2, writing to another church, Paul says, you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You had no spiritual capacity to, to generate relationships. You, you were completely spiritually unresponsive to the reality of God. You were dead in your sins, but God made you alive with Christ, forgiving all our sins. We can't find a way up to God, but God has found a way down to us. And that was Paul's own amazing story. Uh, you may well remember on that highway to Damascus, after a lifetime of religious rituals, there was no one quite like Paul for fulfilling uh, the Jewish law. Um, after a lifetime of intellectual pursuit, Paul was a very educated Pharisee. But none of these things had broken the way into life in God. He was still distant. He did not know God. And then on that road to Damascus, Paul met the Lord. And what happened was explosive. Not explosive perhaps in the sense that we imagine it, but almost a reverse explosion in which every chaotic part of Paul's broken humanity, every deposit of God that had been placed in him, everything about him was remade, reconstituted, as if all the parts flew back into the rightful places in Christ. He was remade in Christ. And that's what God promises to do for all of us. Isn't that amazing that God saw somebody who was this far off, somebody who was a, a mur in murderous pursuit of Christians, somebody who was hidden behind the wall of his religious accomplishments and his own ability. God saw him right there, just as he sees us wherever we are, hidden behind the, hall, the walls of our own experience, good, bad, and indifferent. God loved Paul and God loves us. God sought him and God claimed him in this remarkable encounter. And Paul was knocked over, quite literally, blinded by the light of God and, and opened up 
to a reality he could not previously see. That was Paul's story. But Paul's story was based on God's activity. God had acted in advance of Paul, in advance of us, to make that way prepared. In Jesus, God had entered our world, been crucified on a Roman cross, so that our lives might be repaired. It was the most incredible thing, the most unbelievable thing, in fact. Stomach churning. The cross was the most God-forsaken place on earth. It was intended to be that, a place for pinning down slaves, for eliminating human vermin. It was the worst of places, the most shameful location that could ever be imagined. And who could have believed that the door to life would open from such a heinous and destructive place that was devoid of hope. Galatians 3 verse 13 that we read some weeks ago, Christ, it says there, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. There was nowhere more cursed than the place of the cross. The cross, if you like, is exactly the opposite of academic or religious or spiritual enlightenment. It was sacrilege to religious people and to the Roman authorities in all their might and pomp, it was a sign of defeat and destruction. You don't win when you're on a cross. A cross is for losers. It's a place of defeat. And here in this scrap heap of humanity, where the scum of the earth were executed, God acts to transform everything around. And if God can win victory, from the place of the cross, then God can win victory from any place that we find ourselves. Victory can come from failure, hope from destruction. New life arises from the place of death. That's God's amazing grace, the gift of himself in this most awful God-forsaken place that we might know the fullness of life he promises. God has acted. It was Paul's story God's activity, but also it needs to become a reality. God has acted in what Paul calls grace, his unmerited favour towards us. But grace has, if you like, a condition to it. St. Augustine, one of the early uh, leaders of the church, puts this just brilliantly. He says this, God gives where he finds open hands. God gives where he finds empty hands. You see, the only condition, the only way in which we can find our way to connect with God is the way of humility. When we come honestly admitting our need, when we come, as it were, empty-handed. And of course, the tragedy for many of us is that we try to come to God with, with full hands, we try to impress him with our achievements or appease him with our religious uh, activities. We maybe come with hands full of respectability. We try to impress God uh, into welcoming us uh, that we might know him and be known by him. God ought to expect my uprightness. I've done all the right things throughout my life. I've tried to be fair to people. I've tried to, to do what is appropriate. And we try to impress God by our respectability. Or we maybe come with our own religious heritage. Do you know, I've, I've done all of these things. I've slaved for you, God. I've, I've attended this thing and that thing. And I've, I've tried to do all the right things. I've done my bit. Now it's time for you to do your bit. Maybe we come with those things in our hands. Or maybe we come with our own agendas, our own desire to retain control. We want to have God, but we want to have our own way. We want to do our thing and add a bit of God into the mixture as well. Now, I don't know for you if you were to examine what you bring, um, what you would identify. I'm sure that all of us have a, a mixture of some of these things that we bring in our hands. But God gives where he finds empty hands. Grace comes when we are 
empty-handed. As the old hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. That was Paul's message, and it's the message that has transformed countless lives. It's the message that is still transforming lives. It's the message that admits us into this most privileged relationship, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High, that we know God and are known by God. I hope that today you've been uh, reminded and stimulated to uh, remember the great privilege that is ours, or been stimulated or made curious to think, I could be known by God, I could know God. Wherever you are, I trust that you come before God, conscious that we come with empty hands, knowing that God gives to those whose hands are empty. Thanks for that, Ian. Joe, I really appreciated the reminder that we are all known by God and that we're known by God intimately. He's not distant. He's not far off. He's not impersonal. And all it takes to know him is for us to acknowledge that our hands are empty and that we need him. I think I need that reminder more and more right now. I don't know about you, but I can often act like I just need to fix things. I'm a bit of a fixer. I hate um, to see things broken. I hate to see people struggle. And so I just want to fix things, both for myself and for others. And I can struggle to admit my need of help. And it's good to be reminded that actually no one of us can fix things. No one of us can fix everything in this world. In fact, there's an awful lot in this world that none of us can fix. Yet we can come to God with open hands, with empty hands. And he gives us everything that we need. I think through the pandemic season, um, this has been a lesson that God's been trying to teach me time and time again. Do you know, we face the pandemic. We know that there are economic hurdles up ahead. Um, maybe some of us are already feeling those and feeling them quite significantly in this season. We, every time we turn on the TV or our phones or open a newspaper or, or go onto the internet, all we see is what is going on in Ukraine. And it makes us want to fix things, to fix it by ourselves, to become self-sufficient. But God doesn't ask us to be self-sufficient. He calls us to come to him. He says, come to me. Give me what you're trying to carry right now and take up what I actually have for you to carry. Because what I've got for you fits. It's not going to weigh you down. It's not going to burden you. Let me show you how to live. As it says in the message, paraphrase um, of a passage from Matthew, let me show you the unforced rhythms of grace. And that's my prayer for all of us today, is that we would learn the unforced rhythms of grace from Jesus. That we would come to him with our empty hands, open, ready to receive what he has for us. To receive all that we need from him. And now a blessing as we go. May you know the God who knows you. May you walk with the God who walks with you. May his spirit be in you, upon you and with you. And as you enter this world and this week, may you be conscious that you know God and that you are known by him. May God's grace be with every one of us. Amen.